This is Economy Watch. What you need to know about New Zealand's economic life today. Brought to you by interest.co.nz. Kia ora and welcome to Monday's Economy Watch where we follow the economic events and trends that affect New Zealand. I'm David Chaston and this is the international edition from interest.co.nz and today we leave with news the global financial landscape has been changed by a large bank failure in the US. The sudden unexpected demise of Silicon Valley Bank over the weekend has drawn quick comparisons to the 2008 failure of Washington Mutual. When WAMU failed in 2008 it had $309 billion in assets. Silicon Valley Bank has $209 billion today and will be the largest US bank failure since WAMU. But WAMU's assets were 3.1% of all commercial banks at the time. SVB is only 0.9% today. Still, it wasn't WAMU alone that triggered the GFC. It was the first in a cascade that included much more connected institutions like Bear Stearns and famously Lehman Brothers. In 2023, the only other bank involved so far is the dodgy crypto outlier Silver Lake. On their own, they won't cause a crisis, but they will stress the whole banking system that needs deposit of confidence to avoid a run. Every investor and regulator remembers the GFC banking crisis. The FDIC has taken over SVB and is looking for a buyer. Final bids are due today. For some perspective, in 2008, the largest American bank was JP Morgan Chase with assets of 2.2 trillion US dollars. WAMU was 14% of that. As of the end of 2022, the largest American bank is still J.B. Morgan Chase, with assets of $3.8 trillion. Before it failed, SVB listed assets that were 7.5% of that. ANZ New Zealand has assets of $120 billion. Neither SVB nor ANZ are globally systemically significant on their own. Prior to the GFC, U.S. banks had total assets 10.3 times larger than their shareholders' funds. In 2010, that swelled to 12.7 times. By the end of 2022, this was back to 10.7 times, having improved sharply since 2019. In New Zealand, it is now 11.9 times. Will these levels guarantee there will be no immediate US banking crisis? Of course not. But it does seem unlikely unless there is some other trigger. SVB and Silver Lake's woes should easily be contained by both the state and federal regulators. They know how to do that, and it isn't just the US caught up by the SVB failure. The British are working on a scheme to aid their UK clients. This crisis has sidelined the news of the strong February labour market gains in the US. The US non-farm payrolls were stronger than expected, with the headline number swelling by 311,000 when a 205,000 increase was expected on a seasonally adjusted basis. Their strong labour market just keeps on growing and confounding all analysts. Digging deeper into the actual data, their workforce is now touching 154 million, which is 1.1 million more than in January. This is data from their employer payrolls. If we use the household survey, which takes in unincorporated sole traders as well, the employed workforce is 159.7 million. And it also expanded by just over a million in February from January. Either way, the demand impetus has risen by more than a million people in February, showing why the Fed's efforts to tamp things down have been insufficient so far. Bolstering this swelling is that their participation rate is rising as the healthy jobs market draws more people into employment. That shift is even faster than the jobs growth, and their jobless rate ticked up to 3.6%, although that is still very low for them. The unexpectedly strong jobs numbers on their own were read as likely to bring a strong Fed response at their next rate review, which is on Thursday the 23rd New Zealand time. But SVB may change that, and the partisan negotiations for the debt limit expansion might too. They lurk like a cancer on their political system. Also, the US CPI data is due on Wednesday New Zealand time, and that should have a big influence on the Fed's decision as well. Across the northern border, Canadian payrolls were expected to be unchanged in February after some sharp January growth, and that's what happened, although the actual result was a bit more positive than analysts expected. In Japan, the outgoing central bank governor defended his monetary easing policies after the Bank of Japan's monetary policy meeting, claiming success that their economy is nearing the bank's elusive goal of a sustained 2% inflation. 
And producer prices in Japan increased by 8.2% in February from a year ago, and that's slowing from a 9.5% rise in January. This was less than the expected 8.4% rise and was the lowest producer inflation since October 2021. Of some concern is that the shift in February from January was deflation at almost a 5% rate. They haven't had that in almost 30 months. And China's bank extended 1.8 trillion yuan in new yuan loans in February, down from a record 4.9 trillion in the previous month, but above market expectations of 1.5 trillion. This was also the largest amount of new bank loans for a February month since at least 2004. And the party's National Congress delivered a surprise for their central bank watchers. The respected technocratic head of the bank was not replaced with a Xi loyalist as was widely signalled. Rather, he gets a slate of Xi loyalists as deputies. Extending the surprise, they also retain their current finance minister. Elsewhere, however, it is the hardline lineup expected. Indian industrial production rose in January by 5.2% from a year ago, slightly beating the 5% rise expected. This is on top of a good 4.7% rise in December. And we should also note that the La Nina weather pattern is ending, and we're moving to more normal climate conditions for the next few months. But later in the year, El Nino may well return. At least that's what the weather scientists are predicting. And staying with natural phenomena, keep an eye on erupting Indonesian volcanoes. Like the Tonga eruption, this could have global weather implications. Also watch out for eruptions in Australia, as electricity bills are about to jump by about 20%. The US Treasury 10-year yield starts today at 3.70% and down one basis point from Saturday, which was a huge 22 basis points dump from Friday. On Wall Street, the S&P 500 ended its Friday session down 1.5% and a 4.8% skid for the week. Fears of the Fed's response to the jobs data was compounded by the SVB risks. Markets could well be nervous when they open on Wall Street tomorrow, but we should note that the S&P 500 futures are not indicating that, currently up 1.3% from the actual Friday close. And the price of gold will open today at $1,868 an ounce and up $4 from Saturday. The game from a week ago has been $21 an ounce. And oil prices start today 50 US cents softer at just over 76.50 a barrel in the US, while international Brent price is just under 82.50 a barrel. These levels are a $3 drop in a week. And the Kiwi dollar is softer, now at 61.3 US cents. Against the Aussie, however, we're a quarter cent higher at 93.3 Australian cents and our highest in a year. Against the euro, we're a little change to 57.7 euro cents. That all leads our trade weighted index a little change at 70.1. A week ago, it was at 70.8. And the Bitcoin price has recovered from this time Saturday, now at $20,619 and up 3.5%, so about half of Saturday's fall. The volatility over the past 24 hours, however, has been low at plus or minus 0.9%. You can find links to the articles mentioned today in our show notes. Get more news affecting the economy in New Zealand from interest.co.nz. Kia ora, I'm David Chaston, and we'll do this again tomorrow. Mm-hmm.